I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Melissa Parrish. Your co-host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by Principal Analyst David Perry and VP and Principal Analyst Laura Ramos to discuss our 2024 predictions for B2B marketing, sales, and product teams. Welcome, David and Laura. Well, thank you very much. It's good, uh, good to be here. Likewise, Jen. Pleased to be here today. So let's get to it. Hot topic, generative AI. What are we predicting here? What are going to be the concrete impacts that B2B teams can expect from Gen AI in the coming year? Well, this was a hot topic when we decided to put this particular prediction together. I think out of the rough draft 23 that we started with, 12 had something to do with generative AI. So bottom line is we expect generative AI to have a lot of impact on business. Our research is telling us that that's what people are thinking as well. Uh, And it's going to be a fast ramp. There's going to be benefits to business within the next two years. So the first one that we're looking at is that we made the prediction in this particular report that generative AI is going to help uh, development organizations, product teams, surface insights, that it's going to dictate, you know, one in five new B2B product launches in 2024. Um, So it's going to be an important year for using generative AI to help folks who are creating products uh, understand what their buyers need and help to work some of those interesting ideas, suggestions, and innovation into their products. It's uh, it's interesting, Laura. One of the things I noted in the prediction, and, and I don't want to be cynical about it, but we didn't put successful product launches. We just simply phrased it as product launches. And, um, you know, Something to become a success takes a little while afterwards. It doesn't take overnight. So uh, I'm I'm certainly with it with it on the fact that we will undoubtedly will start to use generative AI in that space. But the question, one of the questions I do have, and people are going to have to watch out for, is how successful those are. Um, you know, with predictions, we talk about um, generative AI sifting through that data to find those nuggets to be able to identify what those key things are. And I think, and it was interesting, it was, in a, it was in a, one of our first takes this week. We've identified, I think Google have been doing some work on that. They've looked at throwing um, throwing AI at some data and identifying 2.2 million different materials that they could develop. And it's looked at them and identified 700. So it's that's something a human just can't do. Yeah, that volume, that scale. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the the 700 still puts a lot on their plate to try and then see what out of there actually should be uh, should be delivered or developed. And then one of the questions I think that that throws up for us is that if you look at the AI that they're going to uh, the data they're going to be using, there's a lot to sift through. There's a lot of information they're going to have to go and look for and look through. And a non-scientific bit of research I've done over the past few weeks in the lead up to this is just talking to clients about what they have. And a number of them are not convinced they've got the data they need to be able to do this. So the other thing, as far as cast clients are concerned, is they're going to probably have to start looking to make sure that they do have data to be able to take advantage of this. Are they tracking what their customers are looking for and what they're wanting or what they're expecting in the coming years? But again, I've got a lot of faith in AI. And I think one of the interesting things will be is maybe AI just goes away and finds that stuff. They do have it. They're not sure they didn't know it. But the way it can scour people's you know, databases and information, it's possible it just goes and digs it out. So it is an in- it's a really interesting prediction. It would be fascinating to see how it turns out. I think it's, it's going to be help in efficiency and in being able to be more efficient in doing things like looking at win-loss reports and competitive intelligence and customer feedback. All of that is what's going to help product teams uh, identify new, maybe non-obvious capabilities that should be in their solution. So it's it's an assistant. It's not going to be like the thing that comes up with the idea. I think there are two things uh, of interest in what you've both said that we don't always talk about, especially when it comes to applying generative AI to B2B. The first is that, uh, David, I think what you were saying earlier comes comes down to that old adage of garbage in, garbage out, right? Do we have the right data? Is it is it working? One of the really amazing aspects of generative AI that I don't think people talk about because it got a little bit lost in earlier conversations about machine learning and earlier versions of artificial intelligence is that large language models can tell you 
if you have garbage. <laughs> and they can also tell you if what you have is not garbage. So I think that's one of the applications for, for B2B companies that will be really interesting to see if, as you said, they start applying generative AI and the tools come back to them and say, you thought you didn't have this, but actually uh, you have some really interesting things here. The other aspect, uh, I'd love to know both of your perspectives on this, especially as it applies to product development. Generative AI, we, uh, Forrester in general, I personally, we do not believe it's going to replace humans. It's going to, as you said, Laura, create some efficiencies that allows humans to focus on the things that we can uniquely do. So, I love this idea of, is it going to be incremental product change or is it going to be step changes? And my guess, I wonder, especially if we're talking about predictions that are uh, sort of near term, my guess is that generative AI is going to have more of that um, iterative impact that people are then going to be able to take in our companies and really make them have a huge impact. So if we start seeing some incredibly innovative things in the next year, I bet that's going to be humans assisted by AI as opposed to generative AI. Do you do you agree with that or am I way off base there? No, I, I would agree with that. I think the opportunity is that, um, you know, sometimes the, the people using the technology, using generative AI to help with things like doing research on what kinds of what's happening in the market and what kinds of product innovations should we be trying out next gain extra confidence when they know that the tool has helped them look at all the possibilities and narrow it down to the things that they should be most focused on or on the flip side of that looked at all the possibilities and helped them figure out something that they may not have thought about on their own it's those it's those uncorrelated databases that sit there with the information on them that their AI is going to get those nuggets that we as humans struggle to struggle to find struggle to identify because we would never have thought of looking in those two buckets we only thought about the one bucket and that's where some real opportunities uh, come for it I think to to help with that as you said that incremental innovation that then leads to step changes. So I don't, I don't want to be the downer here, but maybe we should talk about what the negative prediction, uh, Laura, that you had alluded to earlier is as it relates to generative AI and, and B2B teams. So, so another prediction from this report is that thinly customized generative AI content, content that is generated by AI, and it probably absolutely will have human oversight. But that starts out in AI um, is going to degrade the purchase experience of the folks who are looking at it and reading it and inter interacting with it. Um, for, for most, 70% is our prediction of the buyers. Now, this is something that we've been looking at for a long time at Forrester. We do, what, what are, we do buyers journey surveys and we're looking at well, what do buyers prefer and care about in content. And generally, we've seen that they aren't happy with the content that they're getting from vendors. Um, they want it to be more personalized. They want to talk about their industry. They want to talk about their issues. And as you know, marketers are, and sellers, so, so the number one use case that our data is showing for generative AI is content creation, no surprise. But as marketers and sellers repackage and reuse content, using generative AI to do things like okay, take this and repurpose it for a different industry or for a different use case. The indications are that generative AI does a B plus, you know, B level, maybe even B minus level in terms of creating something that fits the bill. And to get it right, the human's going to have to either work with the tool to make it closer, to make the output closer to what they're looking for, or they're going to have to... Um, spend way more time customizing their prompts and everything to get what they need. And as a result, some people may not realize that, that they need to do all that work. They throw something through it and say, yep, that looks good enough. And, and now you've got content that isn't as creative or sharp or on message as maybe it should be. We did some research last year uh, with a, another analyst, uh, Paul Ferron, where we looked at 66% um, of, of our the people surveyed said that 
a lot of content focused far too much on style over substance. And I think, as you've highlighted, the risk is that that gets perpetuated through the use of AI. But sitting here in EMEA, um, I'm, I'm based in London, is we have 24 languages in Europe. And for most countries, most companies, it's difficult to translate that much content into those individual languages. Some countries are quite happy with, you know, whether it be French or whether it be English or Spanish or whatever it is, they're quite happy. With Other countries, they need to be able to communicate. They want to communicate in their language. And so it's, it's a thin application, but getting that stuff converted has historically been a real challenge. And I think AI has got a huge opportunity to, to do that. So they will love the fact that they're now being engaged with in their own language. Um, and that puts, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a substantial step forward. That, that barrier that marketers and sales teams has has gone potentially with the use of AI. And, uh, you know, throwing a, throwing a side thing, and I don't know, Laura, whether you're a, a fan of, of science fiction, but there's a, there's a book, a series of books called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in there, there's something called a Babel fish. And the Babel fish does that simultaneous translation. And maybe this AI stuff is the first step on the way that we as marketing and salespeople can use to actually be able to communicate directly and make ourselves understood in their languages. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us. That is a great point. I, I think, though, for the marketers that are struggling with this and, and even like the sales people, too, from the standpoint of, am I going to be able to use this assistant to help me be more productive? Um, the thing that the marketing is going to need to invest in is is buyer understanding, you know, maybe doing some more work, to create better personas uh, and and really understand the buyer's journey. Do some customer persona interviews and then use that information, the transcripts from that, you know, run that through your large language model and and use it in a way that's going to help you really understand how what is the language that would appeal to your your buyer. And and in the European case, being in the, their native language is certainly appealing. But in, in across industries and, and use cases and problem sets, you know, just changing a few words to be in that industry's lingo can be very helpful too. But you don't know that unless you have the data behind it that will let you make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, you as the human want to make those decisions. You're not going to leave that up to the Gen AI tool to be like, oh, use this or that. Exactly. I'd love to uh, focus in on that buyer that we keep talking about, because one of my favorite predictions or a couple of my favorite predictions in this report are around uh, who the buyer is going to be in the coming year. And I say it with an air of mystery, uh, because I know that when we did our most recent um, uh, buyer study, there were some really stark observations that we were able to make for the first time, uh, and they are going to change things for uh, those of you listening to this podcast right now. Um, I, I guess those that was a, a semi-spoiler alert. I don't know. I hope I didn't steal anybody's thunder. <laughs> um, tell me about uh, the changes we expect to see in the buyer in the coming year. So the changes that we're going to see in the buyer are really, we think, being driven by a generational factor. You know, people still think about millennials as being young people. But they've now gotten to the point in time where they are in like the, the, the early mid the early to mid part of their careers. They're very productive part of their careers. And they are we, we our research shows that we expect them to be making up three fourths of the buying teams in B2B in 2024. Three fourths. So when they are engaged in buy face to face buying. Um, our data shows that they want personal interactions with product experts. And this is going to be tough on the sales organization because they want to talk to the people who can answer their questions directly from a technical or usability or how is this going to help my business kind of perspective. And we expect, for example, to see in our next survey that 40% of these young buyers are going to rate person to person meetings with product experts um, as their most meaningful interactions. And when that's happening, you've got to then question, how does this change 
the role of the sales organization and the role of the seller in that particular account. And, and we think it's that it's actually going to, and, and that generative AI could actually have a, a, an impact on this as well, because the sellers are going to need to be smarter about what their customers need and also smarter about who's in my organization to help them. And if they are, are become like, rather than trying to close a deal immediately, are alle alleviating these buyer friction points in a smarter, more seamless manner, then we think those top sellers are going to forge better relationships, better partnerships with uh, their, their prospects, with their existing customers, but also with the experts so that the salesperson becomes the coordinator, the orchestrator of the good stuff that the customer needs, buyer needs, as well as the good stuff that we have to offer through our experts, and that we're not fatiguing our experts with a lot of work in front of clients, but thinking along with marketing of ways to tap into that in more creative ways. No, absolutely. I, I, I would though, Laura, I'm just going to drag us back a little bit to the to the this concept of and we spoke about it again at the beginning, the millennials. And I think it's a I think that's a that's a really important point about the the change in profile of our of our target audiences. Um, you know, that as has already been intimated, you know, millennials are now in their can be in their mid forties. They can be they can be younger, but they can be in their mid forties. And I think our research showed that um, you know, th that sort of age is going to start dominating the C-suite. It's going to start dominating those senior buyer groups. And they've brought, they don't, they've brought through with them their native digital abilities, knowledge, preferences, which is the important point. So they suddenly want to engage in just that way. And we're going to have to, from a marketing point of view and a sales point of view, certainly go with that. We can't, there's, you know, trying to swim against that and force them to accept the way they we dealt with their predecessors is not necessarily going to show good results. So this, this move with the times type capability, and I, I was, you know, talking, I've got some youngish children. Sorry, I've got some oldish children, actually. They're not that young anymore, but they're digital natives. And they, that is their preference for engagement. And if you can't engage with them that way, then they're not that interested. So, you know, that's a big learning that I think we're all going to have to go through because this is a new generation of people coming through. Are there any regional nuances that we need to pay attention to? If so one of the areas from we're seeing from an EMEA point of view is the whole question around really the compliance of uh, in relation to AI and its use. And we have seen one of the predictions of it say, looking at for next year, is 50% of large European firms will proactively invest next year in AI compliance. So it is a hot topic for our, uh, our customers over here. And one of the big areas that's being looked at in that space is the whole issues around all the challenges around GDPR and how that could be impacted by running things on an automated basis. So this has been a really interesting conversation. And no matter what we're talking about, we come back to generative AI. And I think that has been the case in many conversations in Forrester across personas and functions and roles and teams. I'm wondering, is there a high level uh, takeaway that you would like our listeners to understand regarding generative AI and its impact on their businesses in the coming year? Yeah, I think that our data is showing that when we talk to business people, B2B, uh, marketing, sales, product, whatever, that, that when they're, they're very bullish on what's going to be happening. You know, um, our data shows that four out of five believe it's going to have a positive impact on their business. So to temper that, you know, we can't let it become the wild west and everybody trying all kinds of things. Um, because I think one of the things we're going to find out fair, fairly soon is that there's a cost associated with building models, uh, you know, getting the results out. And, you know, we can't be spending tons of money looking for different iterations of an image of the, you know, snow princess in the ice palace. And, and so how we work with generative AI needs to be dictated by um, what are the priorities for the business and where are the places that we think we're going to get the biggest return on efficiency. 
Right now, a lot of that is is pointing internally, you know, for how we do things as um, it, it, to help employees be more efficient. And I think where the opportunity is for marketing, sales, and product is how do you use this to be more effective to create content experiences and interactions that are more relevant and personalized to our customers. I think one of the other things we've seen in 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 2023, which will therefore play out in 2024, is this, and I'm not, I'm actually not sure what the right expression is, but it's the walled garden AI, use of AI. I think there were an awful lot of companies out there at the compliance level who were worried about that. And so they'd held back a little bit. They were, people were saying, hey, we need to use this. As we said, it will drive efficiency, it will improve business. But there was that concern that you're suddenly risk opening up your gates to your sensitive information being exposed externally. But now with the these walled garden approaches that a number of the vendors are offering, that's become less of a concern. And therefore, we can use it with more confidence and more safe and, and safely and avoid you know, intellectual property issues, et cetera, getting, getting in the way, which I think has opened the doors. And why with that happening in 2023, it's why 2024 will see such a such a big expansion in its use. One of the things that I like is that one of our colleagues came up with this diagram, and it says um, magic, multiplier, mayhem, and mistakes. And these are the four potential outcomes of generative AI in the near future. And as you were saying with the walled garden, that really helps to lower the risk on the mistakes and mayhem and use it in ways that seem magic that are really going to help me as an individual gain that efficiency and confidence that I need to be a better uh, marketer, seller, product person, employee in general. Thank you both for joining us today. You're welcome, this was a real pleasure. And thank you very much for me as well from this side of the pond. Clearly 2024 will be another very active year for AI across the enterprise. To read more of our 2024 predictions, visit forrester.com slash predictions. And be sure to join us on January 18th for a live webinar where we'll do a deep dive into even more of our predictions for the year ahead. Thanks for listening.